there were, uh, again, the five different uh, families within the order of, of, of uh, the Capromogliformes. Um, any of you that have been down to northern South America and, and seen uh, oil birds, you know that these are one of the few birds that actually uh, uh, utilize caves. Neat, absolutely neat aspect about these birds is they are one of only two species that you may know uh, have the ability to echolocate. Everybody knows, quite familiar, how well bats do it, how some marine mammals can do it, um, but the, indeed oil birds can do it as well. So that's a neat uh, a trait about the, about the group. And so you've got these others. You've got uh, the putus that are found in uh, South America, the frogmouths that are found in Australia and Southeast Asia. You've got the uh, outlet night jars also found in that area, and then ear night jars found in, in, in uh, kind of South Central um, Asia, I believe. So this is just what the the, the overall order looks like, five different families. Again, we're going to focus on the Capromolga Day from here on out. And this is when now we're really going to focus on North America. So taking a, a say, shall we say, a, a, a North American and United States perspective on this family, you've got two different groups, just two general groups. You've got your night jars and you have night hawks. And I've broke, written out, broken up the different species that you could i uh, find in each of those two uh, uh, subfamilies. And again, Chuckles Widows, Whippoorwill, Mexican Whippoorwill, which by the way, was only elevated to species status, I think about six, seven years ago. Um, and before that, it was considered to be a subspecies of the Whippoorwill, but it's now been uh, brought up. You've got common, common poor wills. You've got Parochies, which is a bird, uh, if you head to South Texas, Sandra, South Texas, um, you've got a very good shot at seeing parakis. I've been there just once and we didn't indeed see them. And if you go to southeast Arizona, another a key burning spot, you may very well see buff-colored nightjars. Um, and then again, you've got the three different nighthawk species, uh, the common nighthawks. If you want to see Antillean nighthawks, it's really uh, the Florida Keys, Key West is your best shot at seeing them. And then lesser nighthawks are, are very common in the southwestern United States as well. So this is, a, and you see some of the photos of them. They all share similar traits, you see. Um, I'm not gonna play the song. If anybody wants to bring up, I'm sure you've heard Whip Wills. So Whip, anybody's got their phone now, if you wanna bring it up and play, we can have a little contest. That can, that'd be fine. But anyway, you know that um, they, both Chuck Wills Widows and, and Whip Wills get their name because they say their name with their song. And that, um, is a, a song that is played over and over and over again. Scientists aren't, at least from everything I've read, I've tried to find a why, you know, there's always this why. Why did birds do it? Or why do animals do they do? Why does this, why does this ecological phenomenon exist the way it does or whatever? Anyway, so the question is, why would a whippoorwill, in fact, the record, I think, is 1,388 whippoorwill songs in a row. Why in the world, why, why did it stop halfway through? Why, why do these birds sing incessantly quite often? And we don't really, I, I've not been able to find an answer, but indeed they do. So um, you uh, can certainly avail yourself to uh, hear them by uh, playing on, on your uh, uh, phones or uh, computers at home, or certainly, better yet, going out in the field and, and hearing them uh, live. Um, these, these birds, the North American members of the family, were not, uh, particularly, uh, again, the three that are on Long Island, were not lost on uh, uh, some of the early important illustrators in North America. Mark Catesby, who was really the first most well-known one, um, drew them. So did Alexander Wilson and Audubon. Oh, actually, this is uh, Wilson here. This is Catesby here. Uh, Catesby was the earliest, Wilson next, and then Audubon. And you can see, again, you probably know what really separated Audubon out was just uh, from the others was uh, how the others are kind of just dry and anatomical, but there was a real flourish to the, uh, the paintings that uh, Audubon did. This is his uh, Chuck Will's widow, his Nighthawk down here, and then uh, Whip Will. Some of the key adaptations that this, gr this group has, again, enormous mouths, you can see, and it's Belied by the fact that you take a look at the, this bird's you know, head and, and the bill, or this bird, you think just looking at the bill that this is, these birds have small mouths. You wonder my, how, how might they feed successfully? But in fact, the, the gape goes here all the way back 
almost to the eye, and it can expand quite well, you can see. They've got pectinated toes, which means comb toes, which they use to help um, actually uh, set their feathers straight as they uh, kind of will, will groom themselves. Again, they've got these very unique soft feathers that need to be, to really work effectively, need to be um, as, uh, as, as best in order as possible. Um, they have a, a tapetum lucidum, which a lot of other species do too, but not surprisingly, being of the night, um, that, that, that tapetum lucidum is a membrane that reflects light back out. It enables these species to see quite well at night. And just like I mentioned with the oil bird before about echolocation being a neat trait of the group, well, in fact, the first known example of a bird actually being able to go with the torpor, we didn't know. You know, we know about mammalian hibernation, um, but we didn't really know much uh, up until about 1950s, I think it was 1954, where, where torpor was understood to occur in birds. And that was with, with common poor wills, and the story was about an ornithologist hiking, I think it might have been in Zion National Park, and literally walking along a trail in between uh, two large rocks, a nice little crevice, what was sitting there but a common poor will that was in torpor. He was able to take that bird out, pick it up, look it over well. This is a bird that is really um, uh, very, shall we say, very deeply asleep, and he, he could be, do what he wanted with it. We've since come to learn that a slightly less um, significant or severe version of that regulated um, hypothermia is something that, that birds can do. black cap chick chickadees uh, can do that, and a lot of other birds can drop their temperature at night to help adjust. But we, don't, we didn't really know about torpor, um, and I'm not sure, I don't know of any other birds except uh, poor wills that are known to be able to go into this deep torpor. Okay, another key trait is uh, just how cryptically colored um, they are. Can, can I get a volunteer to come up? I want you, somebody to walk up and, and point out the, uh, the, the night jar that's in the right-hand photo. Can you find it? No, no idea? Okay, well, can you find this one? You see this one, right? <laughs> Facing this way. You see this one. You see this bird here. Do you want, I, I was trying to, I couldn't figure out how to do it with using a, a, you know, a, a, a computer thing to just write, do a little silhouette around and make it spark. Anyway, it's right here. There's his eyes looking right at you. There's his bill. You think you'd pass by that in, on a nature walk and not see it? <laughs> so one of the a, 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 absolute um, uh, important aspects are, uh, of uh, this whole group of birds is just how uh, well they are camouflaged. Um, they, the only the birds that come close, I can think of a few of the shorebirds like American woodcock and common snipe that is so cryptically colored like them. So a really neat thing, and that's important because these are ground nesting birds. So what species we have are definitely ground nesting birds, and it behooves them to be as um, inconspicuous as, uh, as possible. Here's another one. I did put the circle around this one on the right. This is the same photo, but not blown up on the left. Can you see the bird there? It's right there. Again, we'd all be together on a walk. None of us would see it. We'd walk right on by. And of course, that would be what the, the bird would want. Now, this is a whippoorwill. The three um, North American um, species that are found on Long Island are all um, sexually dimorphic, but really, like, as I wrote, weakly so. Common nighthawks, for example, the males have a, uh, a distinctive white throat patch, the female lacks. The males have a white band in the tail that the female lacks. So, not only can you see a bird flying and identify it as a common nighthawk, but you can actually determine if it's a male or female. And the same thing with whippoorwills, with the males, and the and same thing with chucks. Um, with the, uh, here's a chuck here, with the males of that, those two species have white, what they call banner marks on the outside of their wings, while the females are typically colored brown. Again, they still look a lot alike, but you, you can differentiate the two. So there is, they are sexually dimorphic, dimorphic but weakly so. That they, their nest is really not a nest. It is really nothing more than uh, a little depression uh, in the leaves where they'll lay typically or invariably two eggs. Overwhelming number, the size of the clutches 
of, uh, of night jars and night hawks are two. And you can see, not surprisingly, those eggs uh, range from anywhere from being lightly splotched to being heavily splotched, uh, again, as an adaptation to, to not being seen or being more, you know, more, more difficult to see. Okay. You may have heard about night hawks, common night hawks, nesting uh, in urban environments. And in fact, uh, one of the strongholds for this species and hoping to keep the populations up were night hawks that would nest in cities. And there are still some cities throughout New England where this occurs. I remember when I used to work for the uh, New York State Legislature, have, they go to Albany on a regular basis. Every night I'd go out after the legislature, uh, we'd finish and often see night hawks flying over the uh, Albany skyline, regular basis. And these, these were birds that were nesting on uh, you know, the rooftops, the gravel rooftops uh, in the city. What's happened is, unfortunately, as the rooftops have converted from gravel to different types of, you know, basically rubber and plastic, and um, this nesting habitat has been disappearing. New Hampshire Audubon has been pioneering, a, a spearheading an effort to try to get um, some of the, uh, the owners of buildings in Keene, New Hampshire and other cities in New Hampshire to put back at least gravel patches. And they have worked to bring uh, back uh, nighthawks to nest there. What do the young look like? Well, they, not surprisingly, are uh, also uh, fairly uh, cryptically colored. Uh, at, at, at birth, they are, uh, they're, not, they're not really what they call altricial, but they're, um, they're, they're fairly helpless, although they are born with a, a fair amount of, of feathers on it but they really do grow rapidly. Um, if you take a, a, that whippoorwill chick, uh, which is probably, my guess would be about three days old, um, give that another 17 days, that bird is flying. That's how fast, about 19 to 20 days from hatching to being able to fly. And isn't this an adorable look at that biz mom? And the baby's here. Another neat aspect about uh, the uh, uh, whippoorwills um, is uh, they appear to be the only bird that its whole egg laying and egg hatch and breeding is synchronized with the moon. Kind of cool, right? Don't think of that. You see here, whippoorwills appear to have their nesting, um, to time their nesting, so that chicks will hatch about 10 days uh, before the... Uh, the full moon. And since the incubation period is about 21 days, that means that the, I guess the adults will probably really start egg laying uh, at the prior full moon, the month before. They know, maybe they know that that's a, I guess, a, uh, a target to, to you know, lay the eggs. Um, and the reason why they, they think that they circumcise to the, the moon is because they are feeding on insects at night and on full moon nights or nights right around the, uh, the full moon, they can most easily see and be able to, to forage more successfully or effectively to get the, uh, the food that they are going to return, regurgitate to the young when they come back to the nest. So uh, again, another neat aspect about what this species of uh, goat sucker. What's their diet? Um, night jar diets are very different than night hawk diets. Um, night hawk diets, it consists typically of small um, insects of a whole variety of forms. Um, small moths, small beetles, uh, mosquitoes, uh, small bees, other things like that. And you see uh, midges. Um, while the uh, night jars feed on, on larger insects, and they really do like, uh, to wash your grin, giant silk moths and other, other big moths and big beetles. And in fact, um, they also are known, Chuck Will's, widow, Chuck Will's widows are known to eat birds. And you see, do you see the bird in that mouth? There's a northern water thrush that, that this bird caught. And then you can see the gape open again, just how big they are. They swallow the, their in, insects whole and uh, eat them. So they've got a protein, animal-based diet throughout the, the year. They don't eat um, you know, fruits or seeds or nuts. Uh, they really do depend on a variety of insects, and that's important, and we'll explain in a little, just a little while. 
So what are their ranges, to just give you some context about that you know, geographically? Well, Chuck Will's widows are a bird of the southeast of the United States, primarily. Um, and if you've heard them, that's probably where you have if you live down south or, or you lived in, or you, you know, go there on vacation. You can see the, the, the summer range. And they come up the coastal plain to Long Island, and that's about it. There's the, the only um, records I've heard of uh, Chuck Will's widows further north are really accidental uh, occurrences. They're not known from southern New England up to middle New England with any regularity. As you'll see in a second, they breed on Long Island, and Long Island represents the northern uh, terminus for Chuck Will's widows uh, in, with regard to their range. And then during migration, you can see they migrate down and over winter in ex anywhere from extreme northern South America into, into Central America. Whippoorwills have a, a distribution further north, pretty much anywhere east of the Mississippi, uh, in appropriate woodland of uh, enough size, you're going to uh, hear whippoorwills, and they too also um, will migrate south. Again, they, can, they need insects, so they, they're going to need to go to warmer climes where there's still uh, insects that are active, and that means southern United States down into eastern Mexico and then down into the northern part of Central America. And then common nighthawks, amazing uh, uh, range these birds have where they are found pretty much all throughout the North American continent and then will highly migratory, more migratory than the other two night jars and will pass through and overwinter in a, a significant swath throughout uh, South America. Well, there's a lot of interest in trying to understand the status of these species. And the um, one organization, College of William and Mary and the of the Virginia Commonwealth University, um, working, they've got a Center for Conservation Biology, Biology has been censusing um, night jar populations for, uh, I want to say, about 20 years now. And uh, if you go on that website, you can see that uh, there's a lot of people throughout the eastern United States that, that do just that. They'll get assigned a route, you follow their protocol, which is basically you drive, you get a 10-mile route, you drive um, one-mile distances and listen for six minutes for whatever you uh, can hear and, and, and make a note. Um, you can get those routes individually in those states um, most for the most part. In New York, however, that's not the case. We have to work through the DEC. And so last week I met with Kevin Jennings. Remember Kevin who gave the Bald Eagle present, the update on Bald Eagles yesterday? Um, met with uh, Kevin. We're trying to uh, uh, put together a much better protocol for uh, Long Island. Right now, uh, it's basically New York State Parks, Census is Connecticut River State Park, and DEC does two others, the Otis, Otis Pike Preserve, and I think I think we're part of Rocky Point uh, the property. Well, we've identified at least six and maybe as many eight. We could even maybe squeeze in 10 routes. Um, so we're hoping to, to work with DEC to establish these routes. And we, we're going to need volunteers. So if any of you are, are, are uh, you know, goat, suck, goat sucker aficionados and really want to go out and help the cause of uh, conservation, um, you may want to be assigned one of these routes. And it really just entails going out one night a year Right, and again, prescribed period of time, typically right around the full moon when these birds are most actively uh, calling to be able to document their existence. Well, what's going on with the populations of these species, you might ask? I could see it on your faces. What's going on with the populations of these species, John? Thank you. <laughs> Not good. I got a little bit of bad news for you. Um, all three of these species are declining. What a shock. Uh, but uh, I wanted to at least provide some information that kind of quantifies that in terms of New York. So what do we go to? We go to the two New York State breeding bird atlases, the one in 1980 to 85, and the one more recent, 2000 uh, to 2005. And it'll be real neat to see the, the, the new um, breeding bird data information that will happen from the third iteration of the uh, breeding bird census for the state. So what did we find? If you can just look down here, from 19 to 1985, and I'm, 
assuming that you kind of you know the 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 the, the, the way that um, you know, these are defined and what they mean. If a bird's a possible breeder, probable breeder, or confirmed, there's certain uh, criteria you, you look at. So, in the something like 5,300, I'm making that number up. It's something right. It's very high. Quadrangles in the state of New York, uh, common nighthawks were were occurred in 477 of them. Okay, and they were confirmed breeders in only 45. By two, just 20 years later, from, they went down from 477 to 138. Common nighthawks are only confirmed in eight, breeding, uh, eight quadrangles. So a 71% reduction. Whippoorwills suffered a uh, similar trend of decline, but not quite as bad. They're more common. They had 564 quadrangles where they were found in. In 1980-1985, it's down to 241, just a mere 20 years later, and a 57% reduction. And again, you can see where this has happened. And on Long Island, let me just go back, actually go back if I can for a second. Um, if you look at Nighthawks, um, to make it, again, the Long, Island's, Long Island specific, um, there was uh, just one, one, I think, one probable uh, breeding occurrence and that Nighthawk, I'm sure, being in Queens, was on a rooftop, again, a gravel rooftop. And then there were possible um, located on the eastern end of Long Island. You know, we, there's a very good chance, uh, you know, that, that these Nighthawks uh, are no longer a breeding bird on Long Island. A um, little unusual. I had thought that would have actually the, if you remember the, the two famous fires that burned at Riverhead, um, you know, the Dwarf Pine Plains and up in Rocky Point that burned collectively almost, you know, 10,000 acres of pine barrens, creating this, the open gravel kind of sandy situation that nighthawks like, like to breed in with sparse vegetation, that there would be some documentation there, but I, it hasn't occurred. I am curious about these two quadrangles. I need to reach out to the folks up at Cornell to try to get that information. But anyway, so nighthawks, and then you can see Whippoorwill, the stronghold for whippoorwills on Long Island is the Pine Barrens. So we get another reason to preserve, not, not just preserve the Pine Barrens, but those coastal plain pond shores you learned about yesterday from Steve Young and a whole host of other reasons, protecting our water supply. But if we want to have, have, have uh, the, the, the song of whippoorwills in our future on Long Island, we, we got to keep preserving the, uh, the Pine Barrens. And lastly, reduction. And here's, again, evidence of the uh, Chuck Wills' very limited distribution and just kind of making it to, to New York uh, in the form of Long Island, that's it. So in the 1985, 1980 to 85 uh, breeding bird atlas, you had a total of only 21 quadrangles, only one confirmed, and then you had a decline down to eight, one confirmed. Again, it's probably, there's a, there's a, a a persistent tiny population, I guess, at Oak Beach is where I've learned. And you get Chuck, Chuck's has really got this distribution out in uh, that peak area, and I've heard them out there. I've heard them in the Dwarf Pine Plains and around Quag, and then it seems that there's a small population on the Barrier Island, and that's it. Well, what's causing this decline? Well, if you go in, in to just read in the scientific literature, it seems as if being dramatic about it, the birds are starving to death. They're simply not able to successfully reproduce to get enough energy and to survive because we just have a significant reduction in the overall amount of aerial insects and insects in general, but particularly aerial insects that are available to these. So well, well, was that true for other aerial insectivorous birds like chimney swifts and swallows and flycatchers? Across the board, with limited exceptions, that's the trend, and it's really been documented. And I don't know about you, but I can, I can tell you, just anecdotally, I, I remember going to, uh, you know, when I was a kid growing up in Smithtown, going to play, you know, night basketball games at Maple Avenue Park, and there'd be a softball game going on with the lights. I remember seeing nighthawks flying around these lights, and the amount of insects that were attracted to those lights in Smithtown 
compared to what you see today. You go to a Long Island Duck game. I sit there at the Long Island Duck game. I don't care about the basket, the baseball. I'm looking at the, the entire time. I'm looking up at the light stanchions, and I'm seeing like the whole time, you know, seven innings, I see four more. And once in a while, you see a Nighthawk come by. So uh, there's no doubt that there's a significant reduction in the overall amount of, of insect life that's in the, uh, that, that, that's alive now. And it's various reasons for that. Widespread, rampant pesticide use is thought to be the cause. But it's borne out by a bird that's still very common. Again, I mean, look at the quadrangles of the 1985 for the chimney swift, okay? 3,124 that they were either confirmed, probable, or possible. But by 2000, 2005, they're down to 2,652. So just in a 20 year span, with still a common bird, you've seen a 15% reduction in uh, chimney swifts. And again, you look at the breeding bird atlases for the, some of the swallow species, you see the same trend. So the birds just seem to not have enough food. Well, we were concerned about that. I mean, in the back of our mind, I have I've had an interest in, in nighthawks. And so um, in, in the latter part of October of 2016, I can't remember if I got a phone call, text, or an email from Carl Safina that he was down, I think he and Pat were both down at um, that blue star there, and uh, it was reported there's nighthawks over this pond. you would be interested. So I went down to that pond here, and we'll look at it more, a little more carefully, which is the, in Frank Melville Park in Setauket. There's the, the famous historical little post office. Here's Frank Melville Park, and then goes up into Conscience Bay. See here in part of the whole complex with Port Jeff Harbor and Setauket Harbor. Anyway. Um, and uh, sure, there were, there, were, there were nighthawks, good numbers of nighthawks. So we thought that maybe it would be productive to actually establish a, a nighthawk watch. I went online, and, and there's only one other, you know, you have these hawk watches everywhere, right? That it, and all that hawk watch information gathered by the different hawk watches, several dozen throughout the United States, if, over the span of several decades, can really start providing important and insightful data about population trends, right? And so we thought, well, let me take a look. I can only see, I only know one other Nighthawk watch that exists in North America, and that's located up in New Hampshire again. You do that. So we thought, well, let's maybe do that. So we did. So from uh, August 27th through October 6th, I and other people stood right here, and we looked skyward. Sometimes we look south, Birds flying towards us, across the screen. Sometimes we look north towards Constance Bay. There they are. Sometimes you're forced to feed dogs. Dogs are smart. Being there for over a month, they started, I would bring dog biscuits, and the dogs started getting trained, and they knew that um, they wanted their treats. And so I had to invest the money to buy the, the necessary dog treats for them. But, um, you can see again, this is the night that we actually had a very, very high number of uh, Nighthawks at the, uh, the Nighthawk Watch. Is Eric still here, Eric Powers? There's Eric, he was there. Uh, again, Carl and Pat came down uh, quite often, and, and a whole bunch of other people. So there's our results. Can you read it? No. <laughs> no? I don't think you can. I merely want to point out that that's the information. So what we did is just put down a date the number of Nighthawks, the minutes recorded, and then the individuals that participated, as well as just a brief anecdote about, you know, here it says one lone Nighthawk passed over going south to north and changing course to go west. Um, and then we talk a little, try to talk a little bit about uh, the weather. And so again, we've documented this. And then that's the final tally. So for the fall of 2017, again, from late August to early October, we had uh, 2,046 Nighthawks passed by the, uh, the watch. We, um, we did that over the span of 3,984 minutes or 40 days. And, and this is the important figure because it'll help us uh, look from year to year, right, and be accurate. 0.511 birds per minute is what it came out to be, the average. But it was far from an average each, each, you know, each minute. There were two nights or evenings that were absolutely magical, September 7th and 8th, 
And that kind of is the keeping if you read about when Nighthawks pass through Long Island. I, I am so delighted to have participated, just to have been there. I feel blessed to have been there at the time this happened. September 7th, and it was leading up. I'll just, I'll just go back real quick. Um, if you take a look, um, we, we started getting good numbers. September 3rd, 64. September 4th, 164. September 5th, 101. I got stuck on a rainy day. I had three Nighthawks in 60 minutes. It was very rainy and strongly overcast, so I didn't stay. Um, but we knew that it started, the numbers started building. Um, and so on September 7th, we had 300 night, 302 Nighthawks pass through in 124 minutes. And then the next, next day was just really remarkable, 573 Nighthawks. Um, and I, I didn't know that you could see kettles of Nighthawks. You can see kettles of Hawks. You know, like you go to Hawk Mountain, you see these kettles of broad wings and other things. But sure as heck, we had the kettles of Nighthawks that were, uh, that were passing through. It was really just magical to be there at the time. Um, so given that concern you saw before about the uh, um, decline in, uh, in Nighthawks um, and the, the two nightjar species, uh, I put together a letter, a petition to the commissioner of DEC uh, there's a provision, you may remember, and I think Russ can, Russ can definitely talk about it, used, the, same, the same section was used to try to provide a, more protection to Dimeback Terrapins to close the season on them. I um, mean, that's, that's section 11-0311 of ECL to move to, to provide greater protection to three related Capromulgan species. Anyway, we put together that petition, we sent it off, um, and we're waiting to hear it back. I know it's worked its way down to the Long Island office, and they've been asked what they think about it. What are we asking for with this petition? It's really just to, to, to provide these birds with the legal protected status we think they deserve. Um, and we can say we specifically recommend these species be provided stronger protection by listing the chucks and nighthawk as state endangered. I mean, if you've got, if you've got um, one confirmed breeding quadrangle um, of chucks down from eight 20 years later, uh, earlier, and then it's, you've got similar trends again with the other two species. If you just take a look at, uh, at nighthawks, again, we've, you've only got 174 confirmed in the entire state. Let's say that's off by half. That's still only 350 you know, breeding birds. It's not a lot of breeding birds. So we think anyway, again, that the uh, um, chucks and common nighthawks should be state endangered and whip will be at least state threatened. So that petition has been sent off. To, we've, and I documented, uh, again, the population status by pulling stuff out of the breeding bird atlas. We'll see. Um, we, we're hopeful that the DEC will uh, uh, act on that petition. I will say, I don't know if you've heard the news, is that I've been told last week that, that there's finally some movement. The agency, through that, their wildlife action plan, is looking to actually upgrade and, to re and classify or reclassify hundreds of species, you know, hundreds of species in the state of New York. It's a, a, a really uh, mammoth undertaking, but it's something that needs to be done. And this will be one very small part of that. So that's it. There is a Whippoorwill banner flashing. I've had that particular um, experience twice in the Dwarf Pine Plains. Every June I go out, and I'm certainly going to do it again if you're interested. I go out to the, uh, on a full moon night to the Dwarf Pine Plains and walk around. And I've had as many as 14 Whippoorwills and three Chuckwills widows and as low as three uh, whip wills and, and no chucks in my nights walking around the, uh, the, uh, the uh, dwarf pine plains. So um, I invite you to, to do that. And hopefully you'll see your own uh, whips uh, fly up on the, from a sandy path and, and see that banner flashing yourself. So thank you. That's it. Again, thank you for your patience. I'm sorry about all the technical problems with it. But... Uh, John, a couple yeah. of observations. Yeah. Daniel Carpin. Yeah. Uh, saw a whippoorwill on a hike with other people at the horse barn at Comset State Park. Another sighting at Green Tree Foundation in Manhasset, the uh, Whitney Estate. Other than that, I've never so seen are, them on the are island. A whippoorwill there? What yeah, they're there. Apparently, about ten years ago. So those are the only two sites that I know where there's nighthawks on Long Island. Wait, I'm sorry, Nighthawks you saw? Yeah, Nighthawks. You saw Nighthawks, okay. Do you Both the, sites. The time of year it was? Um, spring, summer, things like that. Okay, good. So those are the only two sites I know of that I can help you. 
Okay, thank you then. The other question. I'm really curious to see if we could get some, if somebody could get, get evidence of, of night hawks, um, you know, breathing on the island, it would be, it would be wonderful. Yeah. Hi, John. Uh, I'm Steve Walter. Yeah, hi, Steve. And I've uh, spent a lot of uh, time putting a lot of interest into uh, observing migration on Long Island over the years. Uh, I ran a hawk watch at Fort Tilden on the south, you know, right. shore. Uh, and I'm very curious about this migration flyway, so it seems, up on the north shore. Yeah. Uh, do you have any thoughts on why yeah. that would be there when there is no real concentrating point, you know, like the south facing ocean? Or have you observed any other species in any kind of numbers along that flyway? Thank you for bringing that point up. I should have, I should have discussed that at the time when I, I brought this up. Um, I have not. I can't think of other species that have, uh, have the same kind of migrational movement on Long Island like night, night hawks have. From what I'm able to gather, from what I've read, is that these are birds that have no hesitation crossing Long Island Sound. They do it regularly. In fact, I was recently out at the, uh, well, not recently, last, last fall, I was out at the, uh, remember if I more remembers, uh, we were out at the uh, 4-H camp and uh, had four uh, night hawks. I could see them coming in across the Sound. They started going right west along the, um, the, the uh, bluffs of, of Long Island Sound, and a number of other birders um, from uh, uh, the old Merchants Bay Audubon used to document nighthawks watching. So what they seem to do is they, they seem to come a, across, and for the most part, the nighthawks don't seem to just immediately, wherever they, they've made landfall on Long Island, don't seem to just keep going across the island. They seem to more turn west, and it seems like from at least the you know, eBird sightings, if you look that up, most of the sightings are, are along the, the northern third of Long Island in the fall. And I lived in Massapequa for 33 years, and it was exciting. I can think of one year in those 33 years, I saw more than six nighthawks. I live uh, in northeast Queens. Nor and I bet you get them, right? Well, uh, they were pretty regular back in the 80s yeah. into the 90s, but I don't really see it much anymore. But I think it, you know, that would be a challenge for the birding community on Western Long Island to try and figure out where these birds are going. I'd love to work with I'd love to have other night, other night hawk watches established to really probably you know, try to more refine detail about what's going on. I suspect the birds, again, are moving across the northern third of Long Island for, uh, throughout the entire, pretty much Suffolk County, I, I know Glenn Quinn, a birder, has reported regularly from Hophog, um, so maybe they're breaking through Hophog and then continuing, and then at some point they, they obviously do break, break south, and, and may, so maybe they're, maybe they're breaking to the southwest underneath northeast Queens, and you're not seeing them so much there, and then continue their journey down through you know, New Jersey and so forth. Yeah. But, I mean, they do show up at Fort Tilden on occasion, and sometimes in the middle of the day. Yeah. Uh, but, I, you know, I guess... There's a couple of problems with really working on that is, you know, if you're doing a hawk watch, well, the hawks on Long Island generally, you know, stop flying before the hawks, the night hawks start. Right. And, uh, you know, night hawk, well, in, it's interesting the dates that you showed because I do spend a lot of time uh, at the Greenwich Audubon Center There's hawk a watch. There's of overlap in terms of the dates. And, uh, yeah, and... Uh, so when I go there for the broadwing hawks, which is from about September 11th through 20th, right. uh, you know, even when that flight is tapering off, I like to stay to uh, look for night hawks, uh, even though I know that the peak there is in the last week of August into early September. But, you know, sometimes we do get some that, good That's nights. pretty good. The 11th through the 20th is still pretty good. You're still, you might be just going out of the peak for night hawks, but it's still pretty good time. And just something else interesting to think about, one last thought on this, yeah. is when you start getting into October, you always got to think about the possibility of lesser Nighthawk. I'm not saying that they're out there, but okay. just something to think about. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Chat with you more about it. Interesting talk. Really interesting birds. Uh, you, wait, wait. You're, one a, you're a plant guy. Hmm? I know. 
Actually, I lived in Houston for a while, and we had a uh, Chuck Wills widow that drove us crazy outside the house pretty much <laughs> with his calls all night long. <coughs> but um, yeah. just curious, you talked about the word goat sucker, but where does the word jar come from? I, you know, that's a good question. Night jar? I don't know. Maybe it's a candy jar. Yeah. 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 Maybe it's the, the, the song was thought to be jarring in terms of its quality or character. I don't know. I don't know where night jar came from. We now all have a homework assignment. Yeah. Hey, John. Hey, how are you? Um, good. Um, I didn't think it was of any significance, but perhaps it is. I, um, I grew up in Hicksville, never noticed Nighthawks on Long Island. Um, my first experience with them was up in Maine, uh, out in the middle of nowhere, where you can hear, you know, they come to the bottom of their of their, of their flight, and they zoom back up, and you hear the right. with their wings. It's so cool. Um, but then I started teaching 25 years ago at the Wheatley School in, in Old Westbury, and every year, right around the first week of school, bam, there they are, right. every single year. Um, oh. So maybe they are cutting south kind of just before they get to, to, to Queens. Mm -hmm. so, so if, maybe I'll, uh, I'll start watching and sending you some information. That'd but, be great. Uh, but a question I have, um, you said that their, uh, their feathers are sort of like um, the, the feathers of owls in terms of their structure. I know that an owl feather is sort of silent when you wave it through the air, yet these guys have that cool sound when they go to the bottom of their dive. You, it sounds like a like an airplane or something. So, so do, you, do you know, can you tell me a little bit about the structure of the feathers and what, if anything, how that bears on making a sound or not making a sound? Yeah, the, their feathers are, are very, very similar except for the, the, the feathers that are in the wings of nighthawks that are, are the cause of that, that, that so the, the sound that they make during the nuptial flights. When you're out. And I, didn't, I should have maybe put that in, but I don't know if anybody's ever heard the, uh, um, the nuptial flight or witnessed it of common nighthawks. And let me just two second tangent on that. So these birds will fly up. I've only seen it once up in the uh, upper pen peninsula of Michigan, up by uh, Sini National Wildlife Refuge. There was just a bunch of uh, uh, nighthawks displaying. And they'll fly up, and the males will then plummet, like woodcocks kind of, similar to woodcocks, plummet, and you swear they're committing suicide. They're flying down to, towards the earth, and then within four to five feet of the um, hitting the ground, they immediately turn, and that causes this whooshing noise through their, uh, their primary feathers that uh, is a it's like, almost like we did like a fan, right? It's like a, a kind of a, a whoosh. Um, and it's really, again, neat to see uh, if you can experience. Again, if you go on YouTube, you can hear it. So it's those, my understanding, it's those, the primary feathers that do that. So those, yeah, their primary feathers are different than owls, because as you know with owls, the, the outer part of their, the, 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 you know, the surface of the, the feathers have the, the, the comb, or, right, mm -hmm. or the reticulations to help right. dampen sound. Mm -hmm. And so if you take an owl, Wing and go like that, you really can't hear it at all, as you say, uh, while you can with other birds. I haven't, I've never done that with a nighthawk uh, feather to, to know if it's, you know, if it's different. But, but their overall feather structure, it's just, it, it's more filamentous. It's just, it's, it's downier, it's softer, um, like owls, and again, like chimney swifts, they, uh, their feathers are. There's, there's, there's less structure up to their, you know, the. Um, to the, 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 the ratchet is not always just a single straight, um, you know, main segment of the, the feather, but they actually right. fan out a bit more. Uh -huh. So they're, they're just softer, <laughs> the best way to describe it. It's nuptial. I'm sorry. It, no, it's a, it's a male fee. He's trying to attract, just like woodcocks do that, something similar. In fact, that that's happening right now. If you go out to Long Island's fields and forests, you can experience woodcock doing this. It's the nuptial flight where the common male, the male common nighthawks are trying to attract a female. And it's, it really is quite amazing. If you stick with it, I just uh, it really suggest how amazing these birds are. Because they are plummeting to the earth, is the best way to describe it. And uh, you really wonder how they're able to... to just turn and literally do a 90 degree turn uh, so quickly, but they, they do. It's a great experience to have. Again, I've only had it once in my life. But. I'll add one more little data point to your migration route. 
uh, back when I used to have a bit more time, uh, so it'd be late 70s, into around the 80 or so, I'd go for an evening swim, sit in the backyard, uh, down near like Oceanside Island Park area, and I'd see a couple of dozen of them flying in the evening in, in uh, late August and September. So that also seems to add, so that's basically a little bit southwest of Old Westbury. Right. So that would kind of add to that idea. Okay. Uh, Jimmy raised a, a really good point. I, I wonder about if, you know, I've spent a fair amount of time on the, on the Barry Beach, the more, Marsh Islands, of the, right, and there's so much insect life there. I wonder if the birds are uh, actually utilizing all of the, the insects that are, that are found in the marsh on, in, in the southern part of the Great South Bay. So if they break across, if they use that at all, if they continue further south. It's really I guess, an area uh, ripe for research to better understand uh, the I'll, movements of nighthawks. I'll add to that uh, yeah. an interesting point. The uh, lapping gulls frequently do that. You see them swooping around like swallows. See that together a lot. Yeah. And uh, we also have a number of insect-eating birds that uh, nest there. The uh, gullbill terns. Uh, certainly we have swallows. We have... Uh, <laughs> Uh, the, uh, the sparrows that are on the marsh, they're insect eaters. So we, we uh, the gullbill terns are interesting because I, don't, I think they're the only ones in the state uh, nesting there. Yeah, they're in, gullbill terns are insect eating terns. On your right. Yeah. yeah. So, so there's a few, uh, quite a few of them in there. Yeah. Thank you. We can talk. Okay. All right, thanks, John. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your patience again.